everyone, and today we're going to start our discussion in Chapter 6. Um, today we're going to talk about work and energy. Now these are concepts that we discussed in pre-AP last year, so the beginning part of this is going to be a little bit of a review. Um, today we're going to talk about three key things. We're going to talk about what is the equation for work, what is the definition for work and how do we measure it. We're also going to talk a little bit about the work kinetic energy theorem, and then what do we do whenever we have work that's done by a force that is not constant? So what do we do when a force being applied is actually going to vary? So let's look at the first bullet point, and that's going to be what is work. So remember that work occurs in physics whenever we apply a force and it moves an object through a particular distance. This little sentence here that's in uh, with an exclamation point, this is muy importante to remember. The force that's being applied and the distance the object is moving, those two vectors must occur parallel to one another. So what does that mean? That, well, I have that on the next slide for you guys, but this is your equation. That work is equal to force times your displacement or your change in your x, whatever that may be. Because a lot of times we're looking at the component of the force in the x direction, you'll oftentimes see your work equation written like this. So you're looking for F cosine theta times the displacement. Because remember, all we want is that part of the force that's actually going in the same direction as the object is going. So whenever you have a situation where you have lots of forces acting on an object, the total work is found whenever you add the work that's done by each force. So let's go back to this exclamation uh, point up here, this sentence, and let's take a look at a little graphic that kind of explains it maybe a little bit clearer. So here in our first picture, we have an object that has a force being applied at an angle. So it's important to realize that the vertical component of this force does not cause the block to move to the right. The vertical component of this force is not going to do any work to move this object in the right direction. So that means only the horizontal part of this force vector here is what's responsible for creating the work done on the object. So that's this example. Let's look at the second example. This is when you have an object that's moving to the right and the force is being applied to the right. So the force and the displacement in this case are in the same direction. This is what we call positive work. So the angle between the force and the displacement in this case is zero degrees because they are parallel to one another. They are going in the same direction, positive work. The next picture you see, we have a displacement going to the right, but a force being applied to the left. So this means they're in opposite directions. With this kind of situation, you're going to receive a negative work value. It simply means that the force and the distance are acting opposite one another. Down here at the bottom we have our fourth example where we have a box that's moving to the right but it's an experiencing a force upwards at the same time. In this case our force and displacement are perpendicular so this force does no work on the box at all. All right as a reminder the units for work are joules and a joule is the product between a newton and a meter. So force times distance, newton times meter, you get a joule. So all energy is measured in joules, so that should tell you that work is a form of energy. So let's take a look at a mathematical example that we can do together. That will help us kind of remember what's going on with work and uh, force and distance. So in this case, we have a box here mass 2 kilograms, and that is 2 kilogram box here, is moving over a frictional floor with a coefficient of friction of 0.3, has a force whose magnitude is 25 newtons applied to it at an angle of 30 degrees. The box is observed to move 16 meters in the horizontal direction before falling off the table. So this I is just telling us that it's going 16 meters in the I direction. So part A says, how much work does the force do before taking the plunge? So let's look at the answer here. Okay, so 
our force is 25 newtons. But remember, all we want is the horizontal component of that force because the force and the distance it's traveling has to be going parallel to one another. So I'm going to do 25 times cosine of e. And then I'm going to take that answer and multiply it by the distance that I traveled. In this case, it is 21.75 newtons. We're going to multiply that by 16 to get the total work or the work done on the box by this force, which is 346 newtons. So this is the answer to B. Part B says, how much work does the frictional force do on the box? So we have a coefficient of friction of 0.3. And this coefficient is equal to the force of friction over my normal force. In this case, my normal force is going to be 20. So that makes my force of friction be 6. So remember that the force of friction is going to oppose the motion of the box, so we expect it to do negative work on the box. So 16 times 6, or I'm sorry, 6 times 16 being the distance that the box travels, we get negative 96 joules per hour for the friction force. Okay, so the next thing we need to talk about is the work kinetic energy theorem. So in order to perform work on an object, it experiences a force. It experiences a force. And whenever something experiences a force, it of course is going to accelerate. So that should tell us that there's an important relationship that exists between an object's initial and its final speeds and how much work is done. So I have a little derivation here for you guys using Newton's second law. Newton's second law tells us that force is equal to ma. So we know that work is equal to force times change in x. So if we plug ma into that expression, we get this. That work is equal to ma change in x. So I'm going to rewrite that up here at the top so you have that as a reference when you're doing this thing. So if the force is constant on the object, which right now it is, we're going to talk about varying forces later, then the acceleration is constant too. And we can use this kinematic, and that is hopefully already memorized, to solve for a change in x. And when we do that, we can rearrange this expression. We say v of squared minus vi squared equals 2a change in x. And then So, if we plug this expression here back into this guy here, we end up with this lovely expression here, which hopefully everyone can remember or does remember from last week. That the kinetic energy of an object, or the energy of an object in motion, is equal to one half mv squared. So when I plug this expression into my work equation up here, I get that work is equal to the change in an object's kinetic energy. All right, so let's look at this example. And let's try to do this one using that concept, right? That work, a lot of times you guys will just see it written like this. Work is equal to change in kinetic energy. So in this one, we have a 70 kilogram base runner slides in the second base and is moving at the speed of 4 meters per second. And the coefficient of kinetic friction for him is 0.7. So he slides so that his speed is zero just as he reaches the base. How much energy is lost due to friction acting on the runner? 
So, and then part B is how far does he slide? All right, so work is equal to change in kinetic energy. In this case, the frictional force is doing work on him to s eventually slow him down. That's doing negative work on him. So, if we find the change in our kinetic energy, we will, in this case, have the work um, done by friction or the energy lost due to friction. Okay, so in this case, since we don't know um, the force per se, we just know the initial speed and we know the final speed because he's going to come to rest at the base. The final speed is here. Then his work is just going to be the change in his kinetic energy. So 1 half, 70 newtons squared minus 1 half, 70, uh-oh, four squared. So when we do that part, we get that our work is negative 560 joules. So negative 560 joules were lost, energy, the energy that's lost due to friction. Alright, so part B then wants to know is or how far does he slide? So this is going to use a little bit of a kinematic to find that our work squared. Oh, actually we can just use our four squared for the first part. So on this one, once we know the work done, and the work is negative 560, and we know our coefficient of friction. So our coefficient of friction is 0.7. So that is equal to the force of friction over his normal force, which is going to be 700. So that makes your force of friction, in this case, be 300. So this is the force that's doing the work on the worker. So we can rewrite this as doing the work with this force times change in x. And that 560 equal 490. which makes your change in x be about 1.9. Okay, so the last little bullet point we wanted to talk about today was what do we do if the force is not constant? So let's look at a graph for a situation where it is. So if we were to plot a constant force, F, as a function of the position, the graph would probably look something like this. This represents a constant force here. Oops. Um, this represents a constant force here, which would mean that the area for this graph would be F times X, which equals our work. So the area under this line would tell us what the work done on the object would be. However, if you have a force that's changing with distance, kind of like a spring, remember we said that the spring force, oops, spring force is equal to negative kx. So as the distance changes, the force is going to change. That makes your um, graph be a little bit trickier, and we actually have to integrate if we want to find the work done on an object in that situation. So I'm going to go through this integration kind of fast. If you guys need extra help with it, you can always come and see me. Or you can look on YouTube as there's a lot of videos on how to do the power rule for integration. So that means that if I'm looking at a graph, and I'll just draw one down here that has nothing to do with this problem. And this was force, and this was my distance. And let's say it wasn't a perfect line. It was kind of curvy. I wanted to find the work done on this particular object. Well, I would be focusing probably between two points, and we'll call those points ooh, x1 here and x2 here. And let's say I wanted to find the area on this graph. Well, that's going to require integration. Here is how we show integration in calculus. 
use this little swoopy S. And this swoopy S is telling us that we are going to integrate this function for the force with respect to x from x2, this position over here, to x1. This is our final position at the top, and this is our initial position down here at the bottom. So let's take a look, um, because the easiest way just to try integration is just to try it and then do it. So on this example, it's a, f it's a spring force, and it's saying, let's say you have a 5-kilogram block on a frictionless table, and it is attached to a spring. And that spring has a spring constant of 800. So I'm going to compress the block a distance of negative 10 centimeters. And I want to find the work done by the spring on the block as it moves from negative 10 to 2. Negative 2. All right. So our expression for our force is negative kx. We just discussed that. So when we write out our integral, that is going to take the place here of our f, all right? So now we're going to integrate this expression for the spring force from x2 to x1. So a little rule about integration, whenever you have a constant, like your spring constant in this case, you don't integrate that constant, you pull it out of the integral symbol. So now our equation looks like this. That work is equal to negative k times the integral of, of x dx from x2 to x1. So, remember, like I mentioned before, whenever we're taking the integral of um, a function, when you're doing the power rule, you're going to do the opposite of a derivative. So, for example, if it was x squared and I wanted to take the derivative of this, it would be 2x because you subtract 1 from the power and multiply it by the old power. In the case of an integral, you add 1 to the power and you divide it by the new power. So that means if I had an integral of x, if I was integrating x through x, this would become x squared over 2. If I was going to integrate x squared, that would become hmm, x3 over 3. All right, so when I integrate this expression here, it's going to become x squared over 2. So, which is what I've written out here. This was our original. So I integrated this, I added 1 to the power, and I divided it by the new power. Negative kx squared over 2, which is what you see here. So I'm going to evaluate this expression from x1 to x2. So I'm going to actually perform the function here. I'm going to plug in my values for x2 and x1, and you subtract the 2. So that makes this expression become negative 1 half. 800. This is our x2 position, which is 0 0.02 squared, minus negative 1 half 800 times 0.10 squared. And then when you do that, you get the work done on the block to be 3.84 joules. All right, and that is it, and I will talk to you guys uh, tomorrow. Bring your textbooks so we can do some more problems.